chapter, beginning at verse 25. And there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, Amen, Amen. Amen. come to me, and take not his father and mother, and wife and children, and brother and sister, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross, and come after me, cannot be my disciple. Sit upon the ground, but come to the cross. I let him have sufficient to finish it. Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. Say, this man can be able to was not able to finish it. Or what man or what king? going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. For as my mother had a great way off, he sent an ambassador and desired to make himself peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. This is but if the talk has lost his savor, then the shall it be season. It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Shall we pray? Loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, we praise you, Lord, that you gave us this opportunity to hear your points. Lord, I'm not worthy. I'm an inadequate man of unclean lips. Lord, I pray that you will sanctify me. And Lord, that you will speak to each and every one of us through me. As our Lord, you may be exalted. As our Lord, we may hear something that is edifying, that exhort, exhorts us, that uh, strengthens us, that helps us to uh, see you and glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So today's uh, sermon, I, I took uh, some of the ideas from Charles Bertrand's sermon, Count the Cost. Count the cost. So, so we are we have seen a small, a couple of parables here, when Jesus was talking about uh, who cannot be his disciple, who cannot be his disciple, and he talked about uh, in the context of uh, many people who followed him. Verse 25. There were many great multitudes that followed him, and looking at them, he was telling them, "I see that you are trying to follow me, but real cost, real price." of following me is very great and you need to understand the price of following me you need to count the cost before you follow me our master and our savior understood exactly what it takes to follow him he knew there are people in the crowd there are people in the crowd who were going to say hosanna in the highest blessed is he that cometh in the name of the lord and the same people would turn around and tell Crucify him, crucify him. Yes, there are many, many who will profess to be Christians. But in order to be truly Christians, there is a price to pay. There is a cost. And our Savior is telling us exactly what a cost is. Before we go into the rest of the sermon, I would like you all of us to watch a small video just as a way of introduction. Uh, this is a video of uh, persecuted Christians in the early uh, first uh, third century uh, Christian uh, history, and the second century. It's uh, right after the disciple John's disciple Polycarp and Perpetua, a small documentary. See the sacrifice that she was making. Her newborn baby, her aging father. None of them deterred her from her faith. She was called to hold on to her faith, and she did. That is the cost that we are called to pay. It may be that none of us here in this room will face the kind of persecution that this woman faced, or body parts faced, or many through the centuries, or even some of our Chinese brothers. 
and sisters that face such persecution. We may not be called to endure such persecution, but we are certainly called to have the same attitude, to be ready for such a persecution. It is costly. Christian life is costly. It is not cheap. A lot of times, people, like salesmen, these evangelists, study evangelists, and many that we hear uh, in the churches today, try to present to us a kind of gospel that's almost irresistible. It is cheap grace. Accept Christ, and you will be forever eternally saved. You will be on your way to heaven. Just say this prayer. You're eternally saved no matter what happens to you. Just on the basis of your prayer, that sinner's prayer, you're eternally secure. Not so. It is true that we as Christians cannot pay anything to secure our salvation. It's impossible for us as human beings to be acceptable in God's sight. It has to be on the terms of Christ. Christ has done it. It is a finished work. But once we become Christians, the cost that we have to pay is tremendous. It is tremendous. You see the example of the blind man. Jesus healed the blind man. When the blind man was shouting, Son of David, have mercy upon me. So they called him. See, now the master called it. And so Jesus asked him, What do you want? I want to see. Jesus said, Upon your faith you shall see, receive your sight. And once he became a man who is able to see, he is expected to do things differently. He is no longer expected to sit by the wayside begging as a blind man. He is not expected to continue to do what he was doing. Now that he is able to see, he is expected to do things a lot differently far differently from what was before. Yes, in a Christian life there is a before and an after. A lot of times we see in our churches today, people accuse of the church that the divorce rate in the church is as much, if not worse, than it is outside. <coughs> the morality level is just as bad as it is outside. They talk about so many things it is all because of this fact that they have not understood the truth about Christianity. That those who are called to be Christians are called to live a life that is far different. Far different. Here we see that when Jesus saw so many people coming after him, he said, you are trying to follow me? Do you know the cost? Do you know the price that you have to pay? To follow me, in verse 26, he says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Yes, this is the very first thing that as a Christian that we are called upon to do is to love Christ much more than any other human being upon the earth. To love Christ much more than your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, yes, your dear wife, your dear husband, that dear child of yours has to be secondary compared to Christ. This is a great price you have to pay. See the example there. Perpetua was able to Heart with her dear child. Maybe days old, maybe months old. She was able to see her father in front of her eyes being beaten for her faith and was able to take it. That is the cost we are called upon to pay as Christians. As Dia Moody talks about a man whom he visited, he saw that man, very devout man, 
he had to go out and step out of the house and yell what he was thinking. Of spending the time with the children in the home. And he looked for children in the home and he could not find any child. And so when the man came back, he asked, where are your children? And the man said, my child is in heaven. And he told the story. When he loved his daughter so much, his daughter was all his life. All his life was surrounded around his daughter. And the time came when that daughter had to die. And she died on her deathbed. She said, Daddy, don't worry, I am going to heaven. And I am sure you will be with me. But that man was so angry, so bitter, that a harmless child had to die. He was he was unable to take it. He could not believe that a, a loving God would do such a thing to his daughter. When he came home, he suddenly heard the voice of his child in the home, and he looked for her, and he couldn't find it. It was very difficult for him to take. His daughter was all his life. Every room he was looking for her. He was trying to listen to her voice. It was a nightmare for him could not sleep well. In a, in a week's time, he found out that he, he heard his daughter's voice. His daughter was calling. He looked, and he looked, and he saw his daughter. His eyes lit up, and he saw his daughter was in a beautiful place. And he realized that there was no sorrow where his daughter was. It seemed like purity personified beautiful place and he wanted to get to her and he found out that there was a big river separating him from his daughter and he tried to cross and he found that the current was too strong too strong and he tried to swim he was in danger of losing his life and so he stepped back and then he heard the voice I am the way the truth and the life and he understood that in order for him to get to his daughter, it is Christ. Christ is the way to reach his daughter. And he became a Christian at that point. And he understood the true love. Who to love more, he understood it. We, as Christians, are called to love Christ more. More than any human being on this earth more than any human being on this earth. Also, this faith is a very costly faith, expensive faith. It costs us so much. It costs us uh, our own life, our, our family, our possessions. It has to be costly. Otherwise, it is not true faith. Yes, it is not true faith. Our faith has to be so strong that it cannot be shaken. There will come a time when everything will be shaken. And we have to have that faith. That cannot be shaken. Our religion, our discipleship is costly. It is expensive. I remember the time when I was trying to use a saw that I bought uh, place like Walmart. It didn't cost me much. It was a saw that I used to cut something in a garden, so I was just trying to cut it. And it broke. The saw broke. And it's very cheap, some ten dollar saw. I think it's, it's not worth it. So I had to go and buy something that's very expensive. It has a lifetime warranty. Anytime it breaks you can go and return it and they'll give you a new one. And I had to pay a heavy price for it. Yes. If you want a, a weapon that will last you at a crucial time, where there is an enemy in front of you and you need to use your weapon to protect yourself, that weapon better be a functional weapon. It has to work. If it fails at a critical moment, it is not good. It says in Hebrew 12 verse 27, one of you has a pen to read, Hebrew 12 verse 27. 
and this word yet once more signifying the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Yes. yes. Those that cannot be shaken might remain. Yes, there will be times when our faith is attacked. Are we able to withstand the attacks? Yes, we need to have a faith that is expensive, that is pressure, that can withstand. You know, the, the cost that we have to pay as Christians, we have to, to give up our father, mother, brother, sister, wife, children. It is a, a call that we are asked to pay a great price, a great price we have to pay. It is amazing that we not only have to forsake a family, it's not that I'm saying, not that oh, we have to hate a family, hate our children. No, it's not what Christ is telling either. What Christ is saying is that if your family comes between you and Christ, who do you love more? Who do you love more, Christ or family? If you have to choose between Christ and family, who do you choose? That's what Christ is telling us. Also, we have to choose Christ above our own self. That's what he's saying. If any man come after me, his own life also he must hate. And Matthew 16, 24 says, if, if any man come after me, let him deny himself. This self-life has to be given up. You know, there is a, that is the very last thing that we want to give up when it comes to making sacrifices. When we have to live a sacrificial life. The very last thing we want to do is to give up our own life. That's what Christ is asking us to do, is to give up our own life. It says in Colossians uh, chapter 3, verse 1 through 5, it's a memory verse, right? And given, uh, recited for us. Colossians 3, 1 through 5. I don't remember that. Can somebody read the side that for us? Colossians 3, 1 through 5. If we So yes, this self-life, the life, the, the, the inclination of the, of the selfish desires, that pamper of the flesh, that uh, exalt, that uh, uh, the urge to satisfy your desires, not necessarily harmful desires, things that uh, gratify the fleshly desires. We saw the list, right, for the things uh, Fornication, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Those are the things you need to get rid of. We saw that in uh, Romans, when we studied Romans 12th chapter, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. To present our bodies a living sacrifice. To say no, we saw that in Titus second chapter, to our fleshly desires, to say no, to our sinful desires. Galatians 5.17 says, the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with all its lusts. This has to be the life of a Christian. Not allowing the, the sinful flesh to have its way to put the flesh on the cross. Then a Raven Hill says, there is one thing certain about a man who is going to be crucified. There is one thing certain 
about a man who is going to be crucified. He is not coming back. He is not coming back. He is going out for good. That is how a Christian has to be. You are not coming back after you cross the Red Sea. You are not going back to Egypt. You have crossed it on the water sea. You are not going back. You do not have a will of your own. When you are on the cross, your hands stretched and nailed to the cross, you cannot even shoo the bird that is built on your head. Your hands are tied. The birds land on, on your head to poke at your eyes, to eat away, eat you away. You will not have the power to, to shoo that bird away. All your rights are gone. That's a crucified life. We heard of your sermons and you talked about the crucified life, where you would not allow even a sinful thought. You are not entertaining and and relishing and cherishing that evil desire at the thought level. We are open about our Christian faith. We confess Christ before men, even at the expense of being called an extremist, or a legalist, or a freak, or whatever other names that they might call us. We are not worried about that. We want to openly confess Christ even if they think that we belong to Stone Age. We are not worried. We count the cost at the expense of self. More than that, we are called to follow in Christ's footsteps. To follow in Christ's footsteps. First John, second chapter, sixth verse says, uh, let me read it. God, uh, he that said, he abided in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Yeah. Even as Christ walked, we must walk. We must walk as Christ walked. Such a sacrificial life. Such a victorious life. A holy life. That is well, that's what we should do as Christians. We have to walk in his footsteps. Yes. John Spurgeon says, a Christian, when he comes to this point, he says, My Lord, I give to you this day my body, my soul, my powers, my talents, my goods, my house, my children, and all that I have. Henceforth, I will hold them at your will as a steward under you. Yours they are. As for me, I have nothing. I have surrendered all to you. This is the cry of a true Christian. Yes. If you have something that you can call as it is yours, you are the master, not Christ. Yes, I, I know I'm talking something that's very strict and stringent in my be disturbing to some of you but this is the way a Christian is supposed to live no authority for anything you are not the master of your life there is another one you are at the beck and call of your master that is Christ that is the way it is for a Christian who counts the cost you have to see that there is a cost to pay as a Christian and as a Christian you have to count if you want to truly become a Christian, you do not believe the people who say, just say this prayer and you are on your way to heaven. Remember the consequences of becoming a Christian. You are called upon to live a sacrificial life. Yes, you have to count the cost. The cost is, it says, he gives us a couple of illustrations here to to exemplify what it really means. He says, which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it? When you build a tower, 
you are trying to understand, you first estimate how much it's going to cost. And then you find out whether you have enough to, to pay for it. It is common sense. When you, uh, you're trying to starting on a project, you first estimate the cost, understand what it takes, and then see whether you have it to do what it takes. Not give it up. Don't try to, to pretend that you're going to do it. Because if you try to do it and you can't finish it, you are subject to ridicule. You are subject to ridicule. Don't want to start it and not end it. Count the cost. Understand what it takes. There are too many false professors to Christianity that brings disgrace to the name of Christ. There are so many who claim to be Christians and do not have it in themselves what it takes to be true disciples. There was a story that was told during the time before independence in India, in Calcutta, where uh, William Carey was ministering as a missionary. A British missionary was there looking at the unrest that was going on in Serampu. I think that was the place where uh, William Carey was. It was unrest. There was a fight between Muslims and Hindus. And the Muslims were on a rampage. They were going out into the streets, dragging the Hindus from their homes and killing them on the street. This missionary was there on the 14th floor, I think, somewhere up in a very vantage point, was looking at all the violence that was going on. He saw the Muslims stop in front of a home that was supposed to be a Christian that was coming to his church. And he was looking at it. Saw the Muslims, Muslim crowd in front of that home. They just walked past. And then they would stop in another home that was supposed to be another Christian home. And they they stopped there. And there was violent talk among themselves. They were talking, they were talking, and they decided to take that Christian man out. They brought him out and they killed him. Later on, he tried to ask, tried to understand why, what was going on. He tried to understand. They found out, this uh, British man found out that the one who claimed to be a Christian was making idols for the Hindus. He was a carpenter in order to make a living. He was making idols for the Hindus. That was the reason the Muslims pulled him out and killed him. See, there are many false professors. The cost is very dangerous. You might look like a Christian by your profession, but when people see you, they know you, they understand who you really are. You do not want to be in that position. Yes, it also says the next example Christ gives is that of a war between two kings. If you are a king and you are going to battle, you first assess the matter carefully to understand whether you have it inside of you to fight the battle. The enemy is twice as strong as you are. Is it possible for you to fight? Yes, you have to assess that matter. If you are truly a Christian, if you are trying to become a true Christian and to become a disciple of Christ, you are engaged in a battle. Yes. A lot of, a lot of people, when they looked at it and they tried to explain the scripture, they seem to think it is a battle with the devil. But I dare to say, I, I have this understanding that it is a battle with God himself. A battle with God himself, yes. There is this doctrine of progressive sanctification, where Christ is asking for dominance in one area after another, one after another. You need to surrender one after another. There is this doctrine of progressive sanctification, where you realize you're on not quite right in this area. You realize you need to surrender in this area, and you surrender. It's like when you climb up a mountain, you realize when you look 
from down, from up there, down below, you notice that there is something crooked. There's something crooked. When you are on the earth, you notice it is straight. But when you are up there, you notice that it is crooked. And so you need to straighten it. So you understand better as you go higher. And you surrender more. This is progressive sanctification. Yes, there is this uh, battle for surrendering. You may be battling God. You may be battling God for those areas. As you realize there is something that you are doing wrong, or some area where you are the master and not Christ, the battle begins. God is saying, give me that, give me that, uh, give me that area. I want to be in charge of that area. God, the Holy Spirit, trying to train you to get to that point where you surrender. That battle is a fierce battle, a strong battle. If you do not surrender immediately, you lose more time, and lose more time, and lose more time. So if you take a long time to surrender one area, and then God is working on another area. You take much longer time to do the other area, and then you surrender that. And you come to the point where you are at the end of your life, and you have not become fruitful. You have not done much for God until God becomes a waterfall. Is not is not the Lord at all? Some man of God said. He has to become the Lord of all. By the time he becomes the Lord of all, you have spent your life. That is when you become like the salt that has lost its savor. Salt that has lost its savor. It is thus for good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. You might come to that point when you decide to become a Christian and you have fought hard uh, to give up your love for your child. It took a long time and then God worked on you to give up your career goals in favor of doing God's ministry. And and the areas you can you can add to that list by the time God became the Lord of all your life. You have spent your life and you've become like one of this salt that has lost its savor. Yes, this is the, some people might call it loss of salvation. And then there is this uh, doctrine that uh, people have of eternal security, doctrine of eternal security. You know, trying to be at the doctrinal level, but it is all the same. I think it is all the same. There are men of God, many mighty men of God, who have subscribed to this doctrine of eternal security, that if you are a true child of God, you are eternally secure. And what about this man who is engaged in sinful life? And you say, if he is a true Christian, he will not engage in that sinful life. God will deal with him. Well, are we probably saying the same thing? Probably we are saying the same thing. The doctrine of progressive sanctification and eternal security. If you have not turned in all areas of your life over to the Lordship of Christ, you have become like that salt that has lost its savor. When salt is no longer salty, what do you do with it? Throw it away. That might happen. We have to count the cost. We have to surrender our lives. There is this progressive sanctification where once we realize we are not, we are in charge and God is not of a certain area in our life. We turn that over. Turn that over. You see that in 2 Corinthians 3rd chapter. 2 Corinthians 3rd chapter in the verse 18. But the open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Yes, so there's this progressive sanctification. We are changed into His image as we grow from glory to glory. Yes. Also, we see that this cost, it is worth it. It is worth it. 
the cost that we have to pay in order to become the disciples of Christ. He is a worthy sacrifice. He is worthy. If you are on a deathbed and the doctor comes along and tells you, take this medicine, you will live. But the medicine is so expensive that it is its weight exceeds the its weight, its value and weight of diamonds. Let's say. I don't know how to <laughs> explain it. Let's say this is a 10 grams of medicine, uh, 10 grams of diamond. No, it's not really that. <laughs> you understand what I'm trying to say? It's, its weight is greater in value than its equivalent weight in diamonds. Almost all your life savings have to go in to buy that medicine in order to save your life. What would you do? Would you die without buying it because it's too expensive? No, you would want to spend all your life savings if possible and secure your life. That is the way it is. It says in Matthew 5 verse 29, it says, I have told you, but you have heard that it was said by them of all time, thou shalt not come into adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, has come into adultery with her already in his life, in his heart, and then he says, Therefore, their right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it out. For it is profitable for you to enter life without that eye. Or, actually, I'm quite proud of it. Can somebody have it? And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Yes, thank you. Yes. It is better that we use one of our eyes than that we end up in hell, right? So the cost is worth it. It is worth it. There's a story that is told of Tulipak and Jagannathan. Some of you know Tulipak and Jagannathan. He wrote that song, Telugu song. And saying that, God, if you are with me, that is enough for me for the rest of my life. Kulipaka's is a household name in the city of Vaisak. His dad was a, a town priest. And there was only one temple, I think, at his time. And he was a priest. And well known. Everybody knew him in the city. And the missionaries came to that town and they were giving high quality education to the children in that city. And when the Pulipaka saw, they wanted it. They, they put their child into that school, the missionary school. This Jagannatham was there watching the missionaries, their conduct, their lifestyle, their faith. He was impressed. He was impressed. And he wanted what they had. And in his teenage years, he embraced their faith as he became a Christian. It brought disgrace to the name of Kulipakas in the town. They said, what are you doing? We are the priests of our of religion. We are supposed to be caretakers and guardians of our religion. What are you doing? He wouldn't relent. He would not give in. He said, their faith is real and I want it. And so they... They threw him out. They threw him out of the house. And he didn't know where to go. But God took care of him. God gave him the shelter. So many Christians sheltered him. And now that you know the story, you go back and read that song. What such a beautiful song. God is enough for all my needs of my life. That's what the Bible is saying. Moreover, you see, the cost that is paid, that is to be paid for us as Christians, is the same cost that Christ has paid. You see, Christ is not calling us to do things that he has himself not done. This is the way our master is. Our master, such a great master, he does it first before he asks us to do it. As the psalm says, our daily bread says, a leader is one who knows the way, shows the way, goes the way. He knows the way, he shows the way, and he goes the way, and he tells us to follow. 
as it says in John 15 20, he says, a, t a pupil is not above his teacher, neither a servant above his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Yes, we are called to live a life in the footsteps of a master. Yes, it says, my servant will be where I am. John 12, 27. Yes. God is with us. Yes, it is true. It may be that we are we're not starting out as super saints at the beginning of Christian life, but as we go through our Christian life, we see that God is with us, helping us walk that life. Yes, it is not possible for us to live the life that Christ has laid out in the Sermon on the Mount. It is difficult for us as human beings to live the that standard. But God is telling us that He is with us, even unto the very ends of the earth. There's this man who, who became a Christian who until then was uh, an alcoholic, drug addict, not a drug addict, but alcoholic, addicted to alcohol. This was a time of uh, Spurgeon's time, he was saying, talking about this man, who would walk past that uh, uh, Gale House, is it what they used to call it? Gale House, the, you know, it's a liquor store, liquor store. The owner of the liquor store was very sad that this man became a Christian. He is no longer stopping at his shop. He walks on, he walks on, he walks on without stopping. He was his best customer, his best customer. So one day he stopped him and he said, why is it you're not coming in? Why don't you stop at my shop? And then he said, Sorry, when I was alone, I used to stop at your house, but now I am walking with Jesus. He is with me. That's why I cannot stop at your shop. Yes, our master is with us. He will help us to walk the way. Yes, we need to count the cost. Christian life is costly. We have to understand there is a great price to pay. Price to pay, a great price. During the crucifixion of our own flesh, but our master is able to do it. Let us follow. Let us pray. Love and follow. Lord, thank you. <coughs> Lord, that you have given us a great time to follow in your footsteps. And Lord, to deny our sinful flesh, its desires, to crucify, and Lord, walk after in your footsteps. Lord, not allow anything in this world or anyone in this world more than you. In Jesus' name I pray.